Good, uh, good afternoon, um, good morning in some cases and good evening in others. Um, thank you for joining us um, here for this uh, webinar, the last of the year for, for us. Um, the title of the, uh, the discussion today is, is why investors should in assess the climate alignment of oil and gas uh, companies. And, and we're going to also um, have a look at how potentially they could go about doing, doing that. Um, my name is Simon Perham. I'm head of uh, investor outreach at Carbon Tracker. Carbon Tracker is an independent, not-for-profit research house um, analysing the impact of the transition away from a fossil fuel energy system on the uh, capital markets. And my background is uh, 31 years in investment banking. Um, We've got quite a packed house. We've got uh, something like 250 people that have registered, um, people from the asset management business, asset owner business. We've got a lot of people from the energy um, uh, energy business as well, which is great, great to see because they're right in the front line of this of, of this issue. And we've got other stakeholders in the, in the form of investment banks um, and, and investment consultants. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to, to, to join us. Um, our objective today is not to sling mud. We're not here to point fingers. Um, our objective um, today is to deliver you the best practical advice that we can give you, the solutions. Um, we can discuss solutions that, that we have, ideas of how to solve these issues as you consider your organization's uh, um, outlook and approach um, to net zero. Um, but in order to do that, um, uh, we're going to need some help from 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 you. Um, my job here is to represent the silent majority, which is you, the audience, and it would be great to see some questions coming through and it would be very, very helpful. So get those questions ready. We have um, the panel here. They're here to, to help you. So it'd be great to see those questions. And if we don't get round to answering those questions, we'll we'll attempt to follow up after the webinar. However, if you submit them anonymously we're obviously not going to be able to do that so please attach your name so we can then if we don't get around to answering them um, we can um, you know ask, answer them after afterwards we've got a great panel here I'm, I'm delighted to welcome um, Tom Allen who is the lead author of the piece that we're going to talk about uh, today he's part of the oil and gas and mining team here at Carbon Tracker also delighted to to um, uh, welcome Harry Ashman. He is Vice President um, uh, in the Responsible Investment Team at Columbia Threadneedle. And uh, lastly, we've got Mike Coffin, who is the head of the oil and gas team um, here at Carbon Tracker. The running order is Tom is going to canter us through his slides, set the scene. Um, that's going to happen. He's got about six, seven, eight slides and it's going to be about 10, 11 minutes. And then we get back into the nitty gritty of the questions that uh, the, the the presentation will bring up and hopefully you will, will bring up as an audience. So if I can hand over to you, Tom, let's get cracking. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I'll just share my screen. OK, so I hope you can all see that. Uh, so today I'm going to start off by talking about why investors should invest in uh, or should assess the climate alignment of oil and gas companies. And then I'm going to move on talking in more practical terms about how they might go about doing that. So why? Well, we break this down into three main motivations. Obviously, there's a climatic imperative to do so. Uh, in order to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, emissions, global emissions, need to fall in the next decade before 2030. Now, by shifting investee companies to um, a Paris alignment, investors can help reduce those emissions. But there's also a risk to the investors' businesses themselves. So investee companies must align with the stated alignment goals of investment products. Um, uh, and if they don't, that could lead to or present the risk of reputational damage, which could lead to the loss of assets under management and ultimately create a going concern risk. 
So we've got a risk to the climate, a risk to investors' businesses themselves, but there's also a risk to their clients or their beneficiaries' wealth. Uh, so we have a new energy system coming at pace. Um, you only have to look at uh, statistics on the build-out renewables or the uptakes of EVs to see that uh, this new system is going to replace almost the entire of the fossil fuel system. And that companies that are um, banking on continued or growing demand for their products are likely to be in trouble. And we see that um, companies that are aligned with uh, Paris and, and falling demand are going to be more resilient in that transition. So that's the why. Um, but in Carbon Tracker's latest report, Paris Malign, we set out um, the how. So this is Carbon Tracker's take on how to assess alignment. And we look at the relative alignment of all the upstream oil and gas companies in the S&P oil index. You'll see as I go through, the charts are focused on the 20 largest companies by market capitalization. But full data on for all 52 companies, uh, upstream companies is included in, in the tables and the appendices of the report. And we base our assessment on companies' future production plans and their investment decisions. Um, and also we, uh, we approach alignment using, um, we try and separate out the question of the company's transition from its alignment with a climatic outcome. And alignment is dependent on the rate at which that company's emissions fall. And for oil and gas companies, that means uh, a decline in their production. So we measure alignment by the pace at which companies move away from their legacy fossil fuel business, rather than investments in, in low carbon activities, for example, which might be important to the future of that business, but don't necessarily have an impact on the climate. So I've mentioned falling demand. Let's see what that looks like. Uh, so the report uses the latest scenarios from the IEA. And this chart here is showing oil demand. And the gray uh, at the bottom of the chart is showing supply from existing and already sanctioned projects. And then on top of that, we have a number of colored lines, which are the demand under the different IEA scenarios. So the base here you can see in this this kind of dark blue green color, uh, 1.5 degree scenario. This is the IEA's net zero by 2050 scenario, which is probably the most widely referenced 1.5 degree scenario. And you can see that oil uh, supply from existing fuels exceeds the demand under this scenario. So if you uh, uh, as an investor have um, a 1.5 degree aligned uh, product, but your portfolio includes companies which are investing in new oil and gas projects, that's potentially a problem. So linking back, uh, that could be a reputational problem for, for your product. Um, but if going to that, perhaps you have um, a, a uh, alignment goal, which is uh, slightly looser, so a well below two degrees scenario, for example. So moving up the chart, we have a, a dash yellow and an orange line. These are to well below two degree scenarios. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's a supply gap between the existing supply and the demand under that scenario. So under a well below two degree, degree alignment, there is some space for new projects. However, um, if you look at the, the curves by 2030, even under 1.7 degree scenario, we already see the production is starting to fall. And by 2035, the decline would make 2020 look like a good year for the industry. Um, so, you know, that brings in a, uh, a link back, this brings in uh, like a, 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 um, a risk to the climate. If, if companies that are sanctioning long life cycle projects um, and we, we exceed this budget, then we're going to exceed this temperature outcome. And then moving up the chart, above that we have um, in the red, um, a 2.5 degree scenario, which is IEA step scenario. Um, and a lot of the companies we look at use this um, implicitly or sometimes explicitly as a kind of base case for energy transition. Um, and you can see it's sort of 
of flat plateau demand out to 2050, which, you know, the more I look at this, more sort of a ridiculous assumption it, it, it appears to be. But if you have investing companies which are banking on this continued demand, actually demand falls more along the lines of a 1.7 or 1.5 degree scenario, then a lot of those assets they're sanctioning today a risk of becoming stranded and they'll be more exposed to the energy transition. So in this report, we look at the supply gaps um, and how we can meet this demand uh, from new projects, but on a um, what we call a least cost basis. So that is we look at the break-even cost of projects and we see um, how we can sort of fill that demand in the most economically rational way by sanctioning the lowest cost projects to meet that demand. And you'll see some of the outputs of that as I go through the chart. So let's start with this production chart. So if uh, in if you're seeking a 1.5 degree alignment, what, what does that mean for your investing company's production? So this chart here shows produ what production might look like in the 2030s as a percentage of 2019% uh, production. So if you looked at the dashed line across the middle of the chart, that's uh, equal to 2019 production. So on the left, we have as a percentage of that production, 100%. And on the right, we have a percentage increase or decrease. So if the production is above that, the production is increasing. If it's below the dashed line, it's declining. And then in the dark blue bars show production from already producing or sanctioned uh, projects. So this is production which is potentially compatible with a 1.5 degree scenario. And if these companies were looking to be 1.5 degree aligned, these are the kind of production clients you would expect by the mid 2030s. So if you look at uh, BP, for example, uh, so near the middle side to the left, um, this the, the, the decline to the blue bar would indicate, you know, somewhere around a 40 or over 40% decline in production. So this is what BP should be looking for to be 1.5 degree aligned. Um, and then obviously on top of this, we have the gray bars. Now this is uh, there as an indication of what production might look like if companies continue to invest in new oil and gas projects along the lines of um, a business as usual assumption uh, for which we use that red steps line from the previous chart. So in summary, um, these companies need to all be planning for production declines to align with 1.5. And we can contrast that with what the companies are actually stating they plan to do. So this is just a snippet from a full table in the report page eight if you're interested um, and it's it's, uh, it's our attempt to standardize the production guidance or, or targets for different companies and what we can see is that the vast majority of companies are planning on production increases so that's production let's look at what companies are actually doing in terms of their investment behavior so this chart here shows CapEx that was committed on projects um, out to 2030 that was uh, sanctioned in 2021 or the first quarter of 2022. And what we can see is that a whole range of companies here are, have sanctioned significant amount of CapEx outside of a 1.7 degree or well below two degree scenario. And obviously this chart is dominated on the left here by Total Energies. Um, and we see here that Total Energies have sanctioned almost six billion of capex on on a project which we see has been inconsistent with you in a two point five degree scenario. Now, if you are um, invested in Total Energies and you have a, a product that has some kind of uh, climate alignment goal, then this is probably a, a project you need to be taking a look at and taking a view on. And if we contrast that with, say, BP on the right. Um, in, in this time frame, at least, BP has been a lot more um, restrained in its sanctioning behaviour. So um, this is just a snippet. This chart just shows uh, sanctions by 
the top 20 companies I mentioned earlier, but in the report on page 32, so we have a table showing the 15 largest uh, sanctions in this time period um, by companies within the S&P oil index. So uh, you know, I'd encourage you to go check out that table and look up your invested companies and, and see, see if they appear in it. So that's looking at what was done um, in, in the last, last year, but what, what about looking forwards? So this is showing potential future capex on new projects by the, the top 20 companies. And it's showing it as a percentage of business as usual uh, for which we use a 2.5 degree step scenario uh, investment behavior. And it's sorted from left to right on the share of that business as usual uh, capex, which is uh, we see as being aligned with uh, 1.7 degree, well below uh, two degree scenario, uh, shown here by the orange and the yellow lines. Um, so how, how to interpret this chart? Well, I mean, the companies on the left will have um, maybe a less aligned portfolio of options. So this is not necessarily what companies are going to sanction, but it's the kind of bucket of options they have in the next 10 years for new projects. Now, if, if you have a, a product which is 1.5 degree aligned, then you know you, you uh, these companies shouldn't be sanctioning any of these projects. But um, and we can see, you know, if we contrast with um, the previous slide where BP looked to be quite good, you can see in this chart, so BP is here somewhere in the middle, that actually BP has a portfolio, a cupboard of options where they could get themselves into trouble in terms of their alignment. They have enough projects in there, they could completely blow their alignment. And that's why it's important for investors to um, uh, encourage the investing companies to stay the course to support uh, those companies that are committing to uh, production declines and to keep an eye on their future sanctioning behavior. And again, uh, in the report on page 28, we have a table showing um, upcoming sanctions or, or projects that are approaching final investment decisions in 2023 that we see as being outside of a Paris Alliance scenario. So again, this is a resource that investors can use to, to see if you know, the investing companies are in there and they can then challenge them on these projects. So in summary, um, you can use this um, Paris Malign report or even just the sort of methodology in it to assess um, investing companies climate alignment um, and you know it's important to do that because of the climatic imperative there's also a risk to your businesses themselves uh, from a misalignment between investing companies and your stated alignments of of your products and finally there's a risk from the energy transition as mentioned you know um, demand for oil and gas is going to fall um, and as an investor, you don't want to be caught the wrong side of it when, when the market finally wakes up to the sort of longer term um, uh, outlook for the oil and gas price. Um, and if you, or companies that are banking on continued growth uh, will be more at risk than a company that is planning prudently for production declines and a 1.5 degree alignment. Um, yeah, so um, I think we we'll have some questions now. Yeah, thanks. My Rob. contact is well, it's the same. Our contact email is at the bottom of this slide. If you have any further questions, please do get get in contact. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That's great. Thanks for out <coughs> outlining that. Um, look, before we go uh, further. Um, uh, by way of a brief introduction to uh, to, to the audience, um, Harry and Mike, would you just like to um, um, uh, give a, a brief introduction to yourselves and, and why you're here on, on the panel? Sure, absolutely. Well, th thank you for having me and thank you to everybody on the line. Um, my name's Harry Ashman. I, I co coordinate the climate change and nature engagement programs at Columbia Threadneedle. 
We've got about $500 billion in AUM, and we also engage and vote on behalf of our stewardship overlay clients who represent another trillion dollars. My personal focus is on oil, gas, and mining. So I'm a, I'm a frequent user of Carbon Tracker's data. I'm also part of several Climate Action 100 plus engagements where discussions on alignment are getting increasingly technical, really, as the rubber hits the road on transition plans. So I'm hoping that this session provides some good insights into how we approach it and the challenges and nuances I'm sure we're all facing, whether we're investors or energy companies or anybody else. Uh, I previously did a very similar role at the Church Commissioners for England, um, and I had the opportunity there to support the Engine Number One campaign at Exxon, which of course had capital allocation at its heart. Mike. Uh, Mike, we can't hear you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, Mike Coffin. Uh, uh, to head up the oil, gas and mining team here at Carbon Tracker. Um, so I've been in Carbon Tracker for you know, uh, three and a half years now. Prior to that, I spent a, a decade at BP um, working in, uh, in upstream, predominantly within exploration. Um, so within the team here, what, what do we do? So we, we look at uh, climate alignment, but also transition risk, for up, predominantly for upstream oil and gas companies. And we look at the, in multiple different lenses. A key lens is... Uh, the emissions, uh, sorry, a key lens is the, the capital investment decision of, of oil and gas companies and the degree to which that's aligned or at risk. But we also look at other lenses too, and perhaps we'll be able to talk about some of them uh, later through this webinar as well. Great. Um, thank, thanks for that, Mike. Uh, look, um, Harry, um, perhaps the first one for you, um, throw you straight in. Um, I'd like you to take us back to the first slide where uh, Tom outlined obviously the, the the three risks or groups of risks that are that that, that face investor companies. Um, it, you know, we know generally about the climate risk, um, the transition risk. Also, you, you know, it's 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 quite well understood. But the the, the middle one, the going concern, the reputational risk. And in our pre-call, you, you talked a lot about that. You spent a lot of time at Columbia Threadneedle talking ab about that. Perhaps you can take um, us through your thought processes when you're discussing these things with your team at Columbia. And what advice or suggestions can you give other teams about how they go about mitigating this these risks to the, you as a going concern, Columbia Threadneedle as a going concern? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a net zero target, like many investors. So there are, of course, risks associated with meeting those targets. Is it possible to hold some of these companies and still achieve those targets? Uh, I, I believe so for the moment. Um, from an investment perspective, when we're looking at this and discussing this internally, a lot of our discussion is really on how can these companies be a viable investment, a viable business in the medium to long term as the transition kicks in? And how can we continue to hold them whilst at the same time saying we have a net zero target and we are pushing for a net zero world? Um, so look, that's where it comes into the engagement. You know, how are companies replacing fossil fuel revenue streams? Are they winding up, returning value to shareholders? Are they investigating new business areas? In terms of how we look at this, there's a few key measures. Um, of course, we look at green capex as a percentage of the total. We look at carbon trackers data on capex alignment, um, and, the, and we're putting those percentages into our net zero model. But for the moment, the, the target alignment with one and a half degrees, it really is a key proxy. Um, and as we see, stated targets and capex do not always align. And that is where we, we need to engage to make sure that we're fully understanding the, the perspective, the perspective of the, of the companies, but also of our, our, of our clients as well to understand whether this is, a, this is something that we can continue to be invested in and how can we, how can we really get the full picture of, of what these companies are facing and where they're headed. Um, accountants employ the term going concern or, or the, the principles of going concern anyway to determine how a company should, should proceed with sales of assets or shifts to other projects potentially now clearly sales of assets to less responsible operators is not ideal but shifts to other products is of course a potentially significant part of any transition plan so there's a few different ways in which we look at it 
Um, but having a net zero target and having obviously various different ranges of responsible, sustainable funds as well, it means that really sort of understanding the company's view and the company's strategy is, is a really important part of that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Harry. I, I guess, um, you know, we've all watched a few um, issues. I mean, Neil Woodford, you know, reputational risk, what, what getting it wrong can mean for your organisation, not not just your your clients money, but but also <laughs> your own your own firm in loss of AUM and and often loss of key, um, you know, key staff. So it's a very real uh, risk. Um, Mike, I just wanted to come to you. There's a there's a um, an, an interesting question um, here um, from um, uh, Keith Keith Myers. Uh, what is business as usual production from a company perspective, and how did you, did you calculate it? Great, thanks, Simon. So. For um, business as usual production, what we do is we ultimately, as, as Tom showed, the co these companies in our in our universe and the ones particularly looking at here, um, obviously they don't always say exactly what their production is going to be and what they're planning on doing. But but they do. Some of them do have targets, and we see that many of them are, are planning on growth, and some are explicit as to to what to the scenario they expect to pan out. For example, Exxon earlier this year were explicit that they see global oil demand. Uh, broadly following that under the stated policy scenario, so at least at the time, a 2.7 degree climate scenario. Um, but what we do in our modelling is we don't take all of the future projects that companies have, um, all the future projects options, but what we do is we take, as those that are those that are going ahead under business as usual, we take those that fit economically with all demands under that stated policy scenario. So that's now a 2.5 degree scenario, and we use a cost curve approach to to, to assess those. So that is the supply gap under that scenario, we take all of the projects that would go ahead in an individual basis and then aggregate those up by at, a, at a company level to identify uh, those, that what, what we're terming as business as usual production. We acknowledge that for some companies that may be a slight overestimate, for, for others it may also be an underestimate because we do see, um, as Tom showed in that chart with, with, with Total Single Lab, that com some companies are sanctioning uh, projects and have done in the recent past really high cost projects that are not compatible even with that 2.5 degree scenario. Yeah, no, no, no that's great. Um, thanks for that. Um, and just while we're on scenarios, um, Mike, Tom, Harry, um, the IEA have just uh, um, produced a new one, the announced pledges scenario um, uh, as a now a well below um, two degree um, scenario. How 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 is that affecting, you know, Mike Tom, your work? And then Harry, how is you know, are you implementing that? What 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 effect has that had on Columbia Thread Needle? So Mike Tom, do you want to go first? Yeah, then? that's I I'll take this first and hand over. So um, so the announced pledges scenario or APS is not a new scenario, but it has a new temperature outcome. So. In previous iterations, it was a 2.1 degree scenario, so slightly outside Paris. And in, in the latest World Energy Outlook, um, the temperature uh, outcome has fallen to 1.7 degree. And that reflects um, recent um, climate negotiations um, and pledges by, in particular, India and Indonesia, and that has reduced that, that temperature outcome. Um, and as such, it's, you know, it's, it's a moving target for people trying to align with that, because it's you know, I, I would expect that number to continue to fall in, in, in future years. Um, but it's important to now to sort of understand that it's um, it's an assessment, a sort of optimistic assessment of where we are with climate negotiations. So it assumes that all um, uh, national uh, pledges are fulfilled on time and in full, um, whereas the uh, stated policy scenario, the 2.5 degree scenario, is one that looks at um, just policies that are implemented or a sort of late stage of the development. Um, so, and, and the other important thing to mention about it is um, it does include uh, the assumption in the future of net negative emissions. At some point in the future, uh, global emissions would go negative in order to uh, uh, claw back the temperature to that 1.7 degree outcome. 
So I, I sort of glossed over in the presentation, but there's a dashed line in there for the uh, sustainable development scenario, a 1.65 degree scenario. And we include that in there because um, uh, a lot of people still reference to it um, for, for their alignment or their planning. Um, but that, that scenario wasn't updated in the latest World Energy Outlook. Um, but it, on that scenario, it's, it's, um, uh, is less um, reliant or doesn't rely on future net negative emissions to, to achieve that temperature outcome. So it's a more um, ambitious target. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll pass it to Harry now and he can sort of say how that impacts him. Yeah, I, look, I th I, it's great to see the, the line changing, isn't it? Becoming more steep. I think it's hugely positive. Um, there's a few ways that this is impacting us or the few ways that we're taking it into account. Uh, one of which is obviously the TCFD report. It's clearly changed the impact of scenario analysis by a significant degree. Um, some of these, like this lower carbon scenario, it's, you know, it's a very real potential outcome. Now, it's not like the projections that we see in the net zero or the, the SDS. I think what could be most impactful, though, and Tom just touched on it there, is the fact that APS includes uh, a degree of net negative emissions. And of course, that is a, a favorite of, of some companies in the industry. Uh, it takes into account you know, the, the support in the US with the IRA. We've seen a lot of companies favoring the SDS scenario as their low carbon test, not the NZE, but then using steps as their base, base case for, for business as usual. So perhaps we'll see the adoption of APS, um, which, which would be good. Um, but I think what's key is that in this scenario, we, we might well see peak oil in 2025 if policy is implemented effectively. Now, that is, of course, not guaranteed. Um, but there's, there's a concerning amount of large projects coming online in the second half of this decade, just as this scenario sees demand falling. So that, that looming specter of a 20% decline in, in oil demand before 2030 makes it clear that stranded assets, CapEx alignment uh, are not issues you know, for, for the next decade. They're issues that we need to be actively understanding and engaging on today. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe I can come, come back on that. Um, you mentioned the sort of Peak, peak demand in 2025, and then you know that presents a problem. Uh, companies you know, quite understandably want to to capitalise on that that peak, which you know might be the, the last peak uh, for their products. At the same time, uh, you have got to remember that um, oil and gas fields obviously have long life cycles that last many decades. So the challenge is how do you how do you supply that peak without ruining tomorrow? Um, and earlier this year, we uh, published. Piece of research called managing people that looked at that very that very um, uh, question um, and um, basically the short the short answer is we found that um, a, a managed approach where companies uh, only sanctioned short uh, cycle projects that were relatively low cost um, went but in the round they were better off so maybe they made slightly less money on the peak but they less lost substantially less money. Um, in the subsequent decade. Okay, okay, yeah. Thank, thank, thanks, Tom. Look, yeah, we've got some quite a number of questions. Please keep coming, um, them, them coming. Um, and I've got one from Phil, who, um, uh, and, and it, it, it sort of dovetails in one of the questions that I that we were thinking out pre here. Mike, can you just go through very briefly why? Um, you know, the further away from alignment with 1.5, the greater the transition risk your that company um, poses to um, investors' wealth, the damage it could do to to investors' wealth. Just to, to reiterate that point. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I think just before I do, I will touch on one one thing. The previous question, which was just around APS versus SDS, and, and as Tom rightly said, um, we put a report called Managing Peak Oil out early this year. But what that did was. We're looking at a scenario, but a scenario where oil does peak potentially in the next two or three years, but then you've got a real rapid change and fall off through this decade, particularly in the 2030s, because and primarily because of the result of the rollout of renewables technologies and the rapid growth of that, plus enabling technologies such as batteries and electric vehicles. Um, and, and that is one of the things that is partly incorporated in, into APS, and the shape of that is a bit different as well. So it's good to see that starting to be incorporated more into the IEA. Um, and, but what we do see there is, as your question, Simon, is around risk, is that by looking at those sorry, scenarios, incorporating them, that the rapid change that we can see later this decade um, really creates a potential disconnect. And again, as Tom said, uh, particularly factoring the long lead times, 
between sanctioning and first first production, but of course then average production and, and sort of the payback periods as well. And um, but 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 crucially, whether you view this as a climate alignment, i.e., policy action on climate and the need to reduce emissions, or the growth of renewables out competing. Um, so whether you view APS as a, a medium transition or a medium carbon or NZE as a low carbon or fast transition, the reality is if you're planning on business as usual and um, then the world it does proceed at a fast transition, you'll be left sanctioning these assets, building and spending money on assets that are just failing to deliver the, a, a expected return. Um, lower long-term demand should lead to lower long-term pricing. Uh, and ultimately, if you sanction projects at relatively higher costs and the price of fall, you just not see the revenues you're expecting. Because that's that's the revenues to the companies. It's not necessarily investments in in um, the financial assets themselves. So as Tom touched on earlier, um, obviously this year we've seen a buoyant period for share prices in oil and gas companies driven by high revenues. Um, but actually, how long is that going to last and who is going to be holding those shares when the share prices um well, when the market really uh, factors in the, the longer term impacts and thus potential for quite rapid changes in valuations as well. So just to sort of summarise that, what you're, you, what you're saying is that those companies that are further away, those companies share price, or those companies who are further away from Paris, the share prices are reflecting greater amounts of future potential returns from, from, from oil and gas uh, revenues. Is that right? Well, I, th I think I'd put it that, that what we're saying, I mean, to, to, your, to, to, your, to your first point, of the, the less aligned you are with Paris, i.e. a low demand scenario, uh, sorry, a low carbon scenario, we could reframe that scenario in, in, as a fast transition scenario. So if you're less aligned with that fast transition scenario, you're exposing yourself to greater risk uh, as the energy transition unfolds. Ultimately, the less aligned you are, the more you're betting on effectively business as usual, high carbon, slower pace of transition. So there's a bigger delta between what could be happening, particularly as you see uh, the effects of the war in Ukraine um, are on the pace of the transition, a drive for energy security, a drive for development of renewables and moving away from that fossil system, um, create that gulf. So uh, companies that are less aligned with Paris are ultimately more exposed to this transition risk. We see. And, and, and presumably the shares that the investors hold. Um, therefore, look. Thanks, 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 Mike. Look, I want to to, to jog along here on, on on slide six and seven. It told us that BP is cutting production by something like forty two percent, and that BP itself is almost Paris aligned. But on other metrics, it showed that BP perhaps wasn't. Why is this, and 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 which metric should should investors believe? And and ultimately, does this mean? that investors can be net zero aligned and still invest in oil and gas. Um, you know, Harry, the thoughts, thoughts from, from, from your side. I'm going to have a biased response because my job is to engage oil and gas companies. If we didn't hold them, it would be a lot harder to engage them. But I, I believe that, that, yes, it is possible to hold these companies and, and still try to be aligned for now. Um, Figure seven on page 29 of your report, uh, I made, made a note of that, looks at existing and potential spending. So that gives us a view of the projects that would be considered under BAU that haven't yet been approved before 2030. Now, excluding Aramco and PetroChina, on average, about half of assumed BAU spending between 20, 2022 and 2030 has not yet been approved. So what that says to me as somebody that comes at this from an engagement perspective is that the issue of CapEx alignment is and, and sort of not approving some of that spending is so relevant for the next couple of years. And it's something that the active ownership community is pretty laser focused on. Now, if companies plow ahead and ignore that concept of alignment, then there is certainly a strong argument for the stance that you cannot be a net zero aligning investor and be in those companies. However, should engagement, economics, policy lead to you know, some cancellations, some re, re, uh, repositioning of CapEx and changing of portfolios, then that there, there is still a chance and, and you know, remaining in those companies and still targeting them at zero as an investor uh, it be, remains viable. Now, th the next few years really are pretty vital on that front. And if, from our perspective, we think that BP are probably way out there on that front. And, and just a quick follow-up question, if I may, um, 
it may be relevant, please indulge, indulge me. You, as an investment manager, you have many mandates. You have net zero aligned portfolios. You have not net zero aligned portfolios. You have massive portfolios. You have different products. How do you balance the the risk to your you know the risk to say for example your reputation as a net zero investor with the fact that you've got mandates from clients that don't kind of mind um, being invested in oil and gas how does how does that sit with you as a team and how do you how do you balance that those risks and how you, do you deal with them because everybody on this call listening to us will will have those problems. It's a challenge. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is a challenge. Um, and, and at the same time, it's a challenge for companies that are saying they're transitioning while still investing in this as well. So it, look, we've, I think we've got 70 something mandates that are committed to net zero and more than that that haven't yet. So what we the way that we look at it as a central team is that we, there's obviously the arguments about physical risk as well. So that applies to everybody. There's also the argument of transition risk. So for every call that I'm having with an oil and gas company about transition, there are sort of six or seven colleagues that are looking at the demand side as well. So even within the microcosm of, of one single portfolio, there's supply side transition, there's demand side transition as well. So there's the need to manage the, the risk and understand the full picture across there as well. When it comes to clients, yeah, that, that is something that needs to be balanced as well. I think the pushback against ESG in general in the US is posing challenges for a lot of us in the industry. How do we do this? How do we how do we balance the various different um, stances of different clients? It, ultimately, though, I think the numbers and the science of looking at the long term risk, the, the fact that these scenarios are coming out, so you don't just have to look at physical risk, you can, you sort of have a much more uh, quantified and obvious demonstration of the potential policy risk as, as policy changes in the APS. All of that is getting harder and harder to ignore. Um, so they all sort of, the, the various different layers of looking at this do come together to make a pretty compelling case for why we should be looking at this across all mandates, net zero committed or not. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. Look, I want to jog on because we've got a few people, and, and a couple of people are, are still putting in anonymous uh, questions. If you put anonymous questions in, we can't come back to you and answer them post post the um, post the um, webinar. So please, you know, make sure that your 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 name is there. And um, we've had quite a number of questions on um, total energies. Um, that um, I, I, you know, it was one of the most extraordinary chart um, slides. Um, slide uh, seven. It said um, that investors should be concerned. And now we know Total Energies. We know Benoit and his ESG team at Total, and and they pre they seem pretty sincere about their attempts to decarbonize. And this looks a bit odd, you know. Mike, Tom, you know, what's what's going on here? Um, what what is happening here? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, obviously, Total Energies have a different view on the economics of this project, and, you know, it's not for me to necessarily challenge that, but in our analysis, we, we see uh, this project, I mean, in particular, this is um, uh, a, a huge greenfield development um, in around Lake Albert in Uganda, oilfield development. Um, we see it as being outside even at 2.5 degree scenario. Now, I know Total um, sort of claim has very low, uh, you know, CO2 intensities, but, you know, that's that's not really the issue at play here. Um, it, the, the operational emissions are, are sort of pretty small compared to the impact from the full life cycle emissions from uh, de decades of uh, future oil production uh, is planned to go up to, to 2045. Um, now, I think they also claim that it, it's aligned with um, uh, 1.5 net, net zero. Um, but, you know, as we've seen under the uh, NZD scenario, um, that oil, oil demand is, is oversupplied from already uh, sanctioned projects. And that was the case in early 2021, but before Total Energy sanctioned this project. Um, so what, what I would say there really isn't a case for is, is a new greenfield 
developments, these kind of mega projects, which used to be the bread and butter of the oil and gas industry, I, you know, I, I don't feel that there's the space for them uh, in, the, in the future. You know, short life cycle projects, that, small tiebacks, these are the sort of projects. But um, uh, yeah, and I mean, the final note, you know, I mentioned about the sort of represent. Uh, reputational damage risk you know this this is a controversial project in even outside of uh, um, the 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 emissions associated with it there's, there's environmental and, and social uh, problems and, and uh, you know a, a lot of people have have take issue with this project so you know if if you are an investor in this in in total energies i think at the very least it's a project you should take a look at and, and take a view on it um uh, yeah I'll, I'll hand over to mike now perhaps Yes, yeah, thanks. Tom. I mean, just to pick up on a couple of points, and I think it touched on a couple of the other questions coming through, but um, one of them would be, well, companies may say, well, hey, it's fine because our projects are lower emissions intensity. Well, as Tom says, the operational emissions is just a small part of the problem. It, uh, there's still going to be the 85% of the problem of the combustion emissions. But the reality is if a company is sanctioning a, a new project and, and justifying that it's somehow compatible with with 1.5 degrees or even Paris because of the low emissions intensity. The reality is that argument only holds true if, if by sanctioning that project, some other project gets retired early uh, and then those, emit, uh, those, those, those hydrocarbons stay in the ground. Now we see that as fairly unlikely scenario to pan out. So, so while it may be better or less bad, I should say, emissions intensity, it doesn't somehow make that project compatible uh, with Paris. So I think that's a kind of really important point. To throw. I think the, the second point I'd make, um, also just broadly around net zero aligned. Well, to me, it's really important when we talk about net zero to talk about what scenario we're, we're using and what temperature outcome that results in. You can have a, a two and a half degree scenario that might reach net zero at some stage. But if we're talking about net zero, let's say talking about reaching net zero by 20, 2050 using the IEA's net zero by emissions by 2050 scenario, which is 1.5, or a different 1.5 scenario. Let's really try and move away or move. Uh, you know, through net zero, but also net zero linked to a specific temperature outcome, an ideally a specific scenario. I think that's also a really important thing too. There's um, also, sorry, Simon, if I might just, just jump in, I suppose more broadly, coming from the perspective, not just as an oil and someone invested in oil and gas, but as a universal owner, there is a risk that any new fossil fuel project, we talk a lot about sort of locking in, um, carbon locking in infrastructure, there's a risk that a project like this might serve to disincentivize the transition in Uganda and Tanzania. So the two nations that previously didn't have much vested interest in fossil fuel extraction, but now do. Um, so for all those project revenues, you know, I'm sure they may well do good in the short term. We really need a balanced long term view of the transition um, at a national level. And that's not always guaranteed in some some countries. No, that's, I mean, that's a very good point, um, Harry. And, and while I've got you um, here, um, and, and this is something that we discussed on the pre-call, you, you talk about there's quite a lot of, it's not unusual for companies to, to sort of claim that they are bringing on new lower cost um, sites um, uh, um, and, and in, in as a, a substitutes to to a higher cost, and then that in some way, you know, makes the, the Paris al aligned. I think Mike calls it making space in your portfolio. And obviously, the key question is what what happens to the the older, more expensive site? What what do they do do with that? Um, you know, what's Columbia Thread Needles' view when when a company comes along and says that? Uh, to you, uh, does that send a lot of alarm bells off, or, or what? Do you, what? Do you, how do you get around that? I, I I think it does. I think Mike summed it up just just now. Actually, for for that claim to hold, you you are relying on the a field somewhere being retired. Now, within a one company's portfolio, that may work if they're taking that overall view. But the oil sector is a it's a global business where not everybody is aligned. Not everybody everybody's pulling in a different direction. Um, for us, there's a question about, I suppose, the strategic positioning of the company. Even if the numbers hold up today, developing new fields raises you know, flags, which can lead to divestment from funds with stricter ESG criteria on, on expansion or restrict banks' ability to do business with the company. It generates controversies, as, as Benoit and the team have, have found at Total. All of that 
diverts time and effort and cash away from potentially investing in the businesses of the future or obviously returning it to, to shareholders. So I think what we would prefer to see from a transition perspective is help to develop those new sectors, gain the experience, get a foothold in whatever transition sector it is that you might be interested in, demonstrate to us as an investor that you're positioning yourselves to, to be viable post-2040. Look, we know we need about 25 million barrels of oil a day under NZD, but we know that doesn't need to come from new fields. We also know we need a huge ramp up in renewables. So why not be part of that or give us the cash and we'll put it in a holding that's better positioned to do that. It's a ruthless business investment management, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. So, so moving a little bit on, on, and again, we've we've had a couple of really great questions, and thank you very much for the to, for for the people that have put put that put these together. There's a number of them. Um, what about Russia? Latest, perhaps your report, Tom, Mike, perhaps doesn't include Russian companies. Um, how has the production that might previously have been attributed to them been handled? Has the portion of the carbon bubble, bubble global demand been given to the companies in, in, at, that are actually in the report? How have you dealt with, how have you attributed the change, the recent change because of the conflict in Ukraine? How have you had adapted this report? Yeah, so we identified a, a like a a universe of companies to, to talk about and reference in, a, in our report. And for that, we used upstream oil and gas companies within the S&P Global Index. Now, earlier this year, Russian equities were, were removed from the index, and that's why they don't appear in, in our report as they have done in previous reports. Um, however, the underlying data and the modeling does include those Russian companies, as it, it also includes private companies and national oil companies and state-owned entities so um there's no reallocation of budget in there um but it's just the fact that we're, we're not we're not talking about them in the report um i mean in a more, on a more general point about the uh the impacts of russia's invasion of ukraine obviously we've seen a uh, a spike in um commodity prices which is you know obviously incentivizing investment in uh, new oil and gas projects at the same time, with what we're seeing is an acceleration of the energy transition away from oil and gas, and this creates kind of a, a double-edged uh, risk for for uh, the sanction of assets, which which are going to become stranded in the future. Thanks, Tom. And Mike, anything to add on that before we move on to the dreaded CCUS and nature base, which I'm dying to ask um, Harry because he's obviously got. And nature capital is his one of his areas of expertise. Um, I, I think the other the thing to say is obviously we we, we take um, we take global demand scenarios and we take supply data from uh, third party, so right we start energy, and obviously you can see details of the methodology within the report um, and the method, company methodology. But I think the thing the point to say is there's a lot of uncertainty. There has been particularly the point where our data is data is provided earlier in the year, and we need to reflect and understand that. And, and obviously going into next year, we plan to update this analysis next year, as we've done the past few years. Um, then we'll, I, I expect to get a bit more granularity and uncertainty about how uh, global oil and gas and the interconnectivity and the um, supply chains will, will change going into next year as well. Um, and happy to talk on CCUS as well on, the, on your next question, Simon. Yes, I know you are, but we're going to... <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it too many times. No, that's all right. <laughs> and it's not me, it's the audience. Then. So, um, you know, a couple of questions coming in from the audience, but also, you know, we've talked about this previously. You know, what role do you, um, uh, um, what about CCS? What about nature based um, solutions? Um, Harry, obviously, this is something that you're quite close to in your current role. How should investors consider the role of both within a net zero plan? You, you know, uh, we've all got our own views, but, but what about Columbia Threadneedle? How do you, you know, if a company says we're going to, um, you know, plant a whole load of trees, um, you, you know, what degree of scepticism or how do you approach that kind of answer when you're engaging with them? And how would you recommend our, our audience to do the same? Yeah. I think if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, the answer would be very different on CCS, but probably pretty similar on NBS. Uh, 
there's far greater acceptance of CCS today than, than there was even a couple of years ago. Um, but it's almost like we need to take a reverse of the carbon tracker approach of the carbon bubble to understand on a global basis where CCS credits are best allocated. So should we provide you be using CCS to, to provide net zero oil? Probably not. There are viable alternatives to ICE vehicles, for example. Should it be applied to the hardest to abate emissions in cement or chemical sectors? Probably yes. So that's kind of the way that we look at it. So it's all about where it, where it's applied. Now, we some allocation of CCS to oil and gas operational emissions we're comfortable with. Um, I think BP and Equinor have about 10%, which, to be honest, feels about right. But we do need more information. We need more information on viability, on costs and timeline of projects. They're often joint ventures. So how are offsets and revenues and costs apportioned between partners? So that we, we're a lot more accepting of it today than, than perhaps even a couple of years ago. On NBS, you know, we know the, the technology uh, works when it's done properly. Um, and, and when these projects are done well, they can have great community, nature, physical resilience benefits. We know there's a nature crisis. We've got COP15 going on at the moment, but we have the same concerns over sector allocation and a lot more about additionality, land rights, uh, co-benefits, community involvement, permanence. I mean, you plant a load of trees, who's to say they won't bend down in 10 years? So there's also a climate nature challenge as well. We investors are always asking for more. And I know there's a few energy companies on, on the line that I have probably spoken to about both climate and nature. And I think we need to avoid investors pulling in two different directions here and companies saying, OK, well, you want us to, to solve the climate crisis and solve the nature crisis. Let's save two birds with one tree. So we nature based solutions sort of present the obvious there on well, we'll create a load of habitats, we'll sequester a load of carbon, job done. That's really not the, the preferred method of solving either either challenge there. So overall, we prefer a very limited role for both with very clear disclosure on costs, credit quality, project due diligence, and with redundancies built in, especially for nature based solutions to to think about that um the, the challenges with the accounting and also the permanence as well. Mike, uh, I think Harry captured many of many of the points I was going to make there. Um, some of some of the ones, I, um, <laughs> many many, but not quite necessarily quite all. So I think I think if we're looking at nature uh, BS in terms of reforestation um, and uh, or protection of existing forests, I mean I think a lot of those scenarios imply that require those to happen anyway. So what we shouldn't be doing is using this to justify further ex expansion into oil and gas, potentially increasing the degree of temperature overshoot and potentially also requiring even greater net negative emissions later, later this century. But I think with all targets, whether they're production tar decline targets or emissions targets, and as we put in our report earlier this year, absolute impact 2022, what, what's really important for the companies with emissions targets is they have a credible approach to re re achieving those emissions targets. And in that report, we also outlined three credibility criteria, which is around asset sales, it's around nature-based solutions and negative emissions technologies, and then crucially linking through to offsets. And actually, can you trace through, if you're investing this offset, what molecule has actually been removed from the atmosphere and perfectly sequestered? The final point on CCUS I make is it's an umbrella term, um, carbon capture, utilisation and or storage, and it encompasses a very broad range of technologies. <laughs> The, the additive effect or the, the, the net reduction in CO2 is very different, whether you're at one end in hardest oil recovery to the other end of actual sequestering of, as Harry rightly points out, the hardest to abate sectors. And then there's a broad spectrum between. So it's crucial if companies are talking about CCUS, investors to actually engage which of the specific <laughs> technologies is it and which, which molecules are actually being extracted and who is taking the credit for that emissions reduction. Okay. Now, we're, we're very close to the top of the hour, but I wanted to, to just uh, bring this one in from Tanya, if, if we can keep it short before we, we overrun. We, we, Carbon Tracker, have previously looked at the inevitable policy response forecast, um, the FPS, um, if you like, um, which is the only scenario out there that actually tries to provide policy technology forecasts versus wish lists or must-haves. Um, um, FPS takes us to a 1.8 degree outcome. Would you suggest investors use this type of tool for, um, as potentially a more 
pragmatic sort of scenario or tool than than for example the 1.5 that, that that doesn't quick thoughts um anybody wants to put their hand up for this yeah i i, I can look at that um i think the work done by the the un the pri on the inevitable policy response is, is fantastic really detailed it's also looking at land use as well, I noticed that was another question. It's certainly something we as an Indo, as a sector, are getting better at looking at. Um, if I'm honest, ultimately, I think everybody is at the start-ish of their overall portfolio scenario analysis. So getting to grips with using these lower carbon scenarios is probably something everyone's been doing over the past two years further digging into the nuance of the different scenarios and sort of tweaking rows here and there um, is what will come next. But I absolutely agree. Basing your analysis on something that has been written down on policy that we know is going to be there is a better way of getting buy-in from all stakeholders. It's also probably, as you say, one of the more realistic pathways than something like NZE, which is based on how do we get to a specific goal, not these are the things that are going to be in place to get there. Mike, you've got 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. So I think the answer to Tammy's question is a good question. And obviously, the FPS is what we used in managing peak oil at the start of the year, that report. Um, I think my answer would be a question back is if you're looking to align with 1.5 or net zero and using net zero is synonymous for 1.5, then FPS is not sufficient because it's a 1.8 scenario. If, however, you're looking to assess transition risk, then uh, scenarios such as FPS, particularly with that shape and that temperature goal and the way it's been constructed, as Harry was saying, uh, is potentially a, a, a potentially credible scenario for transition risk analysis. Great. And on that bombshell, to coin a phrase, we must end. And, and, um, and it only really remains me to thank you, our, our magnificent panellists, also to thank um, our team behind the scenes, uh, Kerry and Evgenia, who, who worked tirelessly to, to make these things look uh, smooth. Um, and, and, and lastly, and most importantly, to thank you, the audience, for spending your time with us. We greatly appreciate it. And, and hopefully we, we've given you some practical advice and we very much look forward to seeing you in, in, in 2023. So um, um, a very um, happy holidays period for you all and, and best wishes. Thank you very much.